Coming up ahead in this episode of X Talk Spotlight. Well, this is quite exciting to see how we can move beyond just census data to really use technology and insights that are available in platforms like H1, for example, where it can surface uh, claims information and more insights and over 9,000 different data sources to really understand patient populations using both healthcare data and disparate data to really paint that holistic view and picture. Hello, and welcome to X Talk Spotlight, illuminating insights from subject matter experts and industry thought leaders. I'm Sonia Hunt. In this episode, we're asking the question, how can clinical research teams use data-driven approaches to foster diversity in research? Due to an increasingly globalized healthcare environment, there is a critical need to ensure that clinical studies include diverse populations in order to improve treatment effectiveness and safety for all individuals impacted by a disease. In this X Talk Spotlight, we explore strategies that are making clinical trials more inclusive with insights from Ryan Brown, Regional Vice President of Sales for Trial Landscape at H1. During our discussion, Ryan shared how incorporating social determinants of health data into trial design can help overcome barriers to diversity in clinical research and how the industry can adopt holistic strategies to conduct more inclusive trials. Thank you for taking the time in the Spotlight interview, Ryan. Oh, my pleasure, Vera. Great to be back. Great to see you. To start us off, what challenges have you faced when trying to incorporate diversity into clinical trials? And how have you addressed these challenges? Some of the specific challenges I've encountered when trying to incorporate diversity in clinical trials often stem around uh, lack of organizational alignment on what diversity in clinical trials means, uh, having the right tools and resources to actually implement, strategize, and deploy these uh, creative strategies. And so that's one of the first and foremost. So when organizations can align and galvanize around what diversity in clinical trials means, why it's an imperative for their organization and empower their team members with the right technology and tools to actually deploy, that's where I've seen things uh, just go really, really well. From a site perspective, it's been incredibly challenging as well when um, things aren't properly accounted for in the budget to reach underrepresented audiences. So making sure that sites can secure sponsor and zero support when coming up with creative ideas that have been informed by the patient population on how best to reach them. And so using data to help justify those pieces has gone a long way and it actually helped uh, me secure some budget when trying to deploy new patient recruitment strategies. And then the last challenge, which is very, very important, is making sure that patients are aware that clinical trials as a care option are available to them. And there has been a lot of research done. Uh, I wanna say that the GCI team did a study where they had asked uh, quite a few African-American women if they would participate in a clinical trial. And over 80% of them said that they would if they were asked. And so I think that dispels the myth that people of color don't wanna participate. And so making sure that patients are aware is um, one of the biggest ways to address that challenge. Now, Ryan, could you explain how social determinants of health data can enhance the inclusivity of clinical trials? And what are some common barriers that need addressing? The social determinants of health, they really help give that additional layer that really helps us better serve uh, the people we intend to reach. And so the data in aggregate can tell you one thing, right? It's nice to know that maybe there is X percent um, of women who are impacted by uh, asthma, for example, or, or lupus. But to really understand what true barriers might be, there was a study that was done that understood that once they started speaking to the women, understanding like actually this schedule of assessments and events is nearly impossible for these working women to make it in. And so looking at what people's incomes might be, their education levels to make sure that we are creating materials that really speak to the heart of the matter and connect with the people we wish to serve who are most impacted by the disease. So really understanding things like um, 
income, education, and there's a really good acronym called PROGRESS PLUS, where it looks at all those various social determinant of health components, including sexual orientation and gender, and those all play a really important part in our ability to connect as caregivers, as researchers, with patients, with people, um, because when you take those things into account, it really helps patients feel like they belong in a study. But when things are written in such a way to where it's very exclusionary, so for example, um, there was a, a program I was doing and um, one of the major requirements was that English must be spoken as part of the inclusion criteria. However, the impact of population was disproportionately Hispanic. And when you don't allow for things like um, language to be considered, it automatically excludes um, those that are most impacted by the disease and that can most benefit from the device or um, modality or intervention that that we're developing, you know, in, in the in the space. And so, um, making sure that we're looking at those things and the environmental factors, which actually play a, a major part as far as whether or not. Patients can even make it to the site or make it to the PI uh, and looking at where the site is located and looking at transportation and access challenges. Those are real things that make an impact as far as whether or not someone will even get asked to participate. And if they can participate and if they are available to, um, when you don't take those things into account, it creates additional burden and barriers that creates a lot of bias in who gets to participate and who doesn't. So really making sure that we take a holistic view at what are all those different pieces that people face day in, day out um, that may, you know, either uh, enable their ability to participate, things like, you know, those that have insurance that might cover certain uh, standard of care procedures that are required to even qualify for a study versus those that don't. So um, really, it's an imperative that we think about people more than just uh, race, more than just ethnicity, but think about, you know, where do people live, work and play? Think about how, you know, people access materials, what are they reading it in? Um, and then thinking through the logistical nightmares of things like, hey, if they have to come here for a very long study visit, and even if it's like a pediatric study, right? Thinking about the entire caregiver uh, the scenario of, you know, we need to take into account that um, these caregivers are going to be with this pediatric patient all day. So thinking through like, what about child care for maybe other siblings? What about time off of work and loss of wages? Um, what about the burden of having to still prepare meals after a very exhausting day or having to uh, get wait for reimbursement for hotel or parking and, and access issues and transportation issues? And those all make a big difference as far as whether or not someone can join or can't join. And so we definitely need to take those things into account. And so what does a holistic approach to diversity in clinical trials entail? And how can data be leveraged to support this approach? So when I think about a holistic approach, I really think about the multiple dimensions of diversity, thinking through things like race, ethnicity, gender, geography, age, and the socioeconomic status of individuals throughout the entire life cycle of a clinical trial. And so that really means, you know, as researchers, it's uh, an imperative that we embed diversity into trial design and that we're looking through uh, and, and thinking about paid participant recruitment and how we select the sites and who's asked to participate and who's not. And looking through uh, things like after trial care, but thinking through the holistic design, right, of what are the uh, barriers to where people can and can't participate. And so uh, as we look across the landscape of what does diversity mean? It means starting globally and really harnessing that global perspective informed by disease, informed by incidents and prevalence, and then using those insights to curate very regional and localized perspectives and using all available data, which has been recommended by the FDA for diversity action plans, and most recently with this draft guidance that came out of MHRA. So looking at how can we use um, Things like AI and data analytics to really help us better predict and understand which populations are underrepresented, who should be uh, included, and looking at 
taking more targeted strategic recruitment efforts and using um, vendors who might have really good uh, insights and relationships into these communities that aren't currently reflected. It means looking across EHR data, claims data, RWE data, anything that we can get our hands on because right now even the data tools are fragmented so that's why it's an imperative that we use all available sources now so we can at least start the big work as well of collecting more robust data to inform our models that we're training ai on so that way we can uh, really make a difference when it comes to uh, diversity in clinical trials but it's the holistic piece where we're taking the entire person to account we're looking through the entire set of design to see does it enable or does it prohibit those impacted by the condition uh, to participate and then we're using all available data and we're implementing that data and we're also training our teams, the site staff, to make sure that people foster that sense of belonging and they're using the data in the right way to really enrich uh, clinical trials. Now, in your opinion, how can technology identify underrepresented populations? And what impact has this had on trial outcomes? Well, this is quite exciting to see how we can move beyond just census data to really use technology and insights that are available in platforms like H1, for example, where it can surface uh, claims information and more insights in over 9,000 different data sources to really understand patient populations using both healthcare data and disparate data to really paint that holistic view and picture of patients and also underrepresented providers as well who might have strong relationships with these communities to make sure that we can grow and build a very robust PI ecosystem and HCP ecosystem that is conducive for diversity in clinical trials. Some of the other ways in which we're seeing is, you know, having these heat maps and visualizations even at the ZIP5 basis level where we can identify not only where the pockets of patients who are impacted by the condition are, but who exactly is treating them, what institutions they're going to, and using really robust public and private sources so that way we can get a full snapshot of, of who might benefit. That's really exciting. And then also looking through, um, mobile health technologies. There's a big advent of uh, uh, what, what, what's happened with the FDA and looking at decentralized clinical trials and just making things more accessible, looking at wearables, looking at mobile apps and looking in any way possible and how can we reach people uh, where they work, live, pray and play. And it's really important, especially when we think about geographic diversity and we think about the barriers that um, lack of access has had for more rural or low income participants. Technology is a huge equalizer, especially uh, when we can uh, deploy it properly and also give the right supportive mechanisms to make technology enablement uh, a reality for those that have historically been excluded. And, and seeing the impact on what could be is really exciting by using technology in this way. And to wrap up, how can the industry redefine traditional benchmarks to prioritize diversity? And what would you say are the key factors in achieving more inclusive trials globally? The traditional benchmarks are would have gotten us to where it takes what almost 10 years and over $2 billion to develop a new compound. We don't have time for that anymore, right? We really need to challenge ourselves in thinking through things differently. And it doesn't mean that we throw everything out. I know that there is great comfort sometimes in going through proven pathways. And so uh, historically, we have relied on past performance data on whether or not we might have um, MSAs and contracts in place with certain sites and certain PIs, which are good, right? So it's helpful to know that you've got proven pathways. However, for us to be disruptive, for us to do something new, it's important that we reimagine uh, how we evaluate what a good site looks like, what a good collaboration partner looks like, because historically it's excluded very viable new providers and new vendors that really could make a difference in helping us move the needle, not just for more inclusive research, but more efficient clinical research, full stop. And so some of the things that I would strongly recommend that we could consider to help us think about this differently are looking through like who actually is treating these patients that are underrepresented and are there things that we can do in a concerted 
uh, measurable, repeatable, and incremental fashion so that way we can build upon those successes and those small wins to create new pipelines and pathways for uh, HCPs and PIs of color, to create new pathways for diversity in our patient populations uh, by thinking these things through. And so it means maybe we consider, hey, you know, and while this particular PI might be new to research, is there something that we could do to either partner with them? Might they need some additional resources if they had coordinators or what kind of facility access do they have? Are there more experienced PIs that they could learn from? But making sure that we wrap our arms around them in a way to where um, they can uh, stand up on their two feet and, and, and actually do um, research and that's high quality and consistent and on pair on par with those that have been doing it for years. And it's going to take a little time, but we need to reimagine it. And some of the things that we could do are looking at what is their the PI's enthusiasm level for research? Are they passionate about this? Because that pulls people through and gets them through the hoops and barriers and making sure they take their GCP training and take the protocol seriously uh, when they have a big why and why they want to do it for their patients that they serve. Um, looking at do they have access to the viable patient population that would be most impacted uh, if they had access to said study? And looking at such things as far as, you know, in incremental quality measures, looking through what resources that they might already have or what uh, investments that they may be able to make, um, and also incentivizing inclusivity, you know, making sure that the service partners are properly incentivized. And some of the great things that I've been hearing that certain sponsors are doing are making sure that the partners they're working with also have a joint commitment to inclusive research and also making it a part of the contract, making sure that there are real benchmarks that um, can incentivize uh, the the teams in meeting uh, inclusivity and in clinical trials. So I would say three key things is just one, reimagining what good could look like for a net new site and also creating pathways for net new providers to be a part of the party, uh, looking at real diversity metrics and setting concrete goals that collectively vendors, sponsors, uh, CRO partners can all uh, galvanize around to try to meet and incentivizing good behavior instead of just always having a stick, make sure that there's some carrots involved to encourage people to want to reach and press toward the mark. Well, thank you very much, Ryan, for speaking with us today. We really appreciate your time and insights. Thanks, Vera. It's been a pleasure. We look forward to learning more about H1's work to help conduct more representative and impactful trials. Thank you all for joining us for this X-Talk Spotlight feature. We hope you enjoyed the discussion. Thank you.